language in the whole uh, region in Tuatin that does not suffer under this problem that the Kurdish neighbors have um, taken advantage of their absence or even their weakness and simply seized their land and built something on it or put their their um, their sheep on it or used it in some other way, either lying and cheating to register it to their own names by false witness or by simply holding a weapon up and, and, and chasing the true owners off. I think there must be thousands of such cases and when we traveled to Abdin with um, Eliu, I think in every village you came to, you could. it was again and again the same thing. This is our land, that is our land, that is our land, but it's being occupied by Kurds who will raise a weapon if you try to farm it, if you try to take it back. Um, Assyrians have simply been crushed under under the weight of that onslaught. Um, and uh, it's important and interesting to note that here the um, the local authorities are not Turkish, but the authorities in charge of of this, for example, this uh, um, this monastery, it's a Kurdish authority because the uh, the culture uh, of of the province is now. Um, administered by the Kurdish local government, by the HTP government, and that makes absolutely no difference. If anything, it is probably worse than the Turkish authorities who have at least tried, who have at least had a bit of fig leaf in preserving uh, cultural monuments. Although they're no better at helping when Kurds uh, seize agricultural lands or villages. Very interestingly, also is that, um, and I think this is a, a sensitive point: the Kurdish movement in in Turkey, the HDP, the PKK, the uh, organizations connected to it, have made a big show of saying that they are a multi-ethnic, multi-national alliance, that um, they, uh, they have taken some Assyrians on board, they have put them in parliament and in, in, in local commissions, and they make a, a huge show of it being, uh, of the Assyrians being on their side against Turkey. But um, when you look at it in practice, what happens, uh, the HDP has not in a single case uh, been able to uh, support the Assyrians in gaining back land from either village guard occupiers or indeed HDP, uh, uh, Kurdish nationalist occupiers who are just as happy to grab uh, Assyrian land as, as the village guards. There were several commissions set up by the HDP in the early days trying to negotiate a compromise between, um, between the church or between a, a Assyrian village and uh, Kurdish pro-PKK uh, tribes who would grab their land, but nothing ever came of it, even though some of their top people were involved in this. And in fact, in many villages, people can show you where PKK or HDP supporters have, um, have grabbed land from them. And I think nothing illustrates this better than this, which is just completely outrageous. This is a, a cemetery a PKK cemetery to, for dead fallen in the Kurdish uh, uh, war against Turkey. And it is located right smack on uh, Tur Islu, uh, in the middle of uh, the last piece of Assyrian, the last piece of contingent, continuous Assyrian land in, in Turkey, southeastern Anatolia. I think there's seven villages and 14 monasteries and churches there on that mountain slope. And Right in the middle of it, of all places, the PKK has decided to build a uh, cemetery, a war memorial to their own dead. I mean, like as if southeastern Anatolia weren't big enough, the vast reaches, and they hadn't had enough of it. They construct their cemetery there, and they refuse to leave it, and to a point where they have uh, sentries established on the road outside it, and you cannot travel from. Uh, Mor'ahu, outside of Badibe, to Mor'awin, above Nusaybin, through all Assyrian lands, you cannot travel through them without passing a PKK checkpoint who asks you for your business. Um, I find this to be um, pretty much the ultimate proof that uh, there, is no, there is no sincerity to their claims to be protecting the, the Assyrians or to be on their side or to, be, to promise them an, uh, a pluralist society. And what's more, this is the same cemetery after the Turks bombed it from the air. And you have to remember that this is within sight of the next villages. This is from this is a few minutes from Harabimishka village, uh, Johann's village. Um, and the people in Kafro, these people in the, in the previous picture, they could see the helicopter gunships firing down. They could see the fire coming down. Um, I was in Akha a couple of days before that attack. 
The whole region was, was, was closed by the military, it was a declared a security zone, and people were trapped in their own houses and their villages. Um, in another attack very close to there, where the PKK was again attacking the, uh, uh, the Turkish military, all the fields at the time that I was there uh, had burned down around the village of Sederi. There, was, uh, there were people who had returned from, families who had returned from Germany and who put all their savings and their family's savings and their brother's savings and the other brother's savings into rebuilding the village and everything had burned down because the PKK had attacked a Turkish bus, uh, a truck there and the fields were set afire. So I find it absolutely um, laughable when the PKK says, when the, when the HDP says they are protecting the Syriacs and they are on the Syriac side because if anything they are bringing the fire down on the Syriacs and pulling them, uh, pulling them into the war on their, trying to pull them into the war on their side. I mean, as you can see here, you can see how close that fire is on that picture. <clears throat> and uh, I mean, what business does the PKK have attacking so close to a Syriac village? And if you need anything else, this is, I guess you all know the picture of this church, which is one of the most amazing um, buildings in existence today, early Christian buildings, the church in Ha and here it is from the inside. <coughs> After the PKK drives a truck full of explosives into it last May, this is a village exclu inhabited exclusively by Syriacs. What is the PKK doing driving trucks full of explosives into the checkpoint outside of it? I find, I find that um, it puts paid to all, those, uh, to all the propaganda and window dressing of putting uh, an, a Syrian into parliament or making them run uh, um, as co-mayors. <coughs> So here we have again uh, Mo'ahu, and here it is from the inside. Where it has been destroyed with pickaxes and shovels. Um, and this is happening up and down and all around the country because in addition to Turkification policies, the Assyrians now into Abdin are also dealing with Kurdification policies, which means a destruction of their uh, cultural heritage and Elio has, is doing such an incredibly important work in documenting what is still there in that heritage and uh, documenting the, uh, the destruction. This should be really support, this needs more support his work and as you can see here because these are, this is about 1500 years old or more and it's going every day, every day somebody's attacking it with a pickaxe trying to make it gone so that um, the land can become Kurdistan. This extends also to uh, the issue of village names that we've seen uh, village, uh, uh, Syrian village names taken down and Kurdish ones put up. We've seen pressure on people to call themselves Kurdish Christians and uh, pressure on the people themselves, uh, indeed. I mean, some of the more striking examples I found there were um, uh, a friend of mine, an acquaintance of mine, in, who was a businessman who returned from, uh, from, from Germany and invested a lot of money and bought, uh, bought some uh, real estate and made investments. And the PKK came around and they put him out of business by extorting him and by asking for so much money, asking him to support the cause and bombing his house when he didn't pay that in the end he had to leave the country. We encountered a young man who was kidnapped by the PKK because he owns an earth mover and they were trying to put him to work a Syriac from a Syriac village, digging <coughs> trenches for them in Idil for their war against the Turks, and so on and, the, and, and so forth. So I would say um, that uh, the Kurdish factor is um, it's probably the most important factor in bringing the return movement down. <coughs> so finally we are left now with Turabdin in a ring of fire. The last time I was there was, this, with, uh, was in spring and uh, it was the ground was shaking, literally. In the immediate, you could hear the explosion from Nusaybin again and again and again. When you drove up towards the villages, um, uh, towards uh, Azak, towards Idil, uh, you, the ground was shaking there from the fighting going on in Idil. You could see explosions on the road, um, the, the, the car bombs that they bury everywhere for the police to come by, and the fields are burning around the villages. Tuabdin is now literally caught in a ring of fire, and of course, Midyat, which was so lively, which saw, saw so much hope and return, is, is empty now. I think the visits fell by 90%. Nobody goes there now. No youth groups are coming anymore. The next generation is cut off from the land um, and, and the memory. No visitors are coming anymore. The economy that had sprung up is gone. The hotels have had to close. The wine production is down. Like, I mean, who, nobody buys wine anymore in Midyat. Um, all that was built in, in the last 15 years is, is falling down. And so I think 
Some people say I'm too pessimistic about this, but I think, coming back to this picture that symbolizes it all, that this is over, this return movement is over. They seized the chance, they made the best they could of it. They had a real chance, it could have happened, but because of a, a number of factors, um, it didn't. And um, I think it's time to recognize now that uh, nobody is going to return to Tulatkin. It's not possible anymore. It's not possible under the conditions that we have now. The people that did try to do it are ruined. Their investments are gone, their spirit is broken. How can anybody, and after all the promise that was there, after all the hope that was there in the early 2000s, how can anyone hope again, how can anybody trust again within the foreseeable future? Even if everything were to, if peace were to break out in the Middle East tomorrow, and Turkey would say, okay, we're going to start all over again, Assyrians please come home, and we will, we will make a new constitution. Nobody's ever going to believe them again, who's going to risk all this again? And this means, since these were the last people that we see here, the last people who were born in Tulatin and have their roots so deep in it that they were willing to risk it all for a return, that this chance is, is gone, the window is closed, because the next generation, try as you might, will not be able to transplant themselves to the wilderness, not children who've grown up with the internet and, and the possibilities of Western Europe. So I think this was a historical opportunity, and this was why it was so important to follow it and support it, and, but it's an opportunity that's over, which brings me to the point that... What do I keep doing wrong? Okay. Uh -uh, okay. So I think it's time to recognize that and, uh, yes, and, and think about how to go forward from here, because now really the land is gone, which was a reference point, which gave hope to so many people for so long. Uh, generations that hope to return to it or bring their children back to it. This is not going to happen, so, and I know that, and what you're meeting about here today is exactly to address that question, how to go forward and, um, and be a people without a land, because I think that just needs to be uh, recognized now. And, um, and as far as I can see, you are doing a fantastic job uh, um, in it. I've visited some of the Assyrian um, associations in, in Germany, and I think it is Again, very, very impressive that children are being born and raised in Germany who speak fluent Assyrian, who can dance Assyrian uh, dances, who can sing the songs, who are happy to meet with Assyrian friends and be a part of that culture. And I'm so impressed to see that yesterday in the European Confederation, up in, at the front table, so many of the people sitting there are so young. It's, it's miraculous. And again, it's a testament to how well you are really doing, and that you are really doing. <laughs> I'm just, I'll be gone, I just want to make one more remark about this because um, I want to point out, because I think this is also an important point going forward and thinking about how to maintain identity and nationhood and uh, the culture and the language without having the land. Um, we talked about this a lot yesterday. I'd like to make one point. This man, his name is Israel, and um, he has made so many sacrifices for the return. He was one of the first to return. He not only saved, uh, sacrificed all his savings and his livelihood, he brought three children back to Turabdin, who didn't really want to come that much, and had a fourth one, that's his son, who was born in the village. His son, his eldest son ran away, he ran back to Europe, broke his heart by running back to Europe as soon as he was 18. His daughter had struggled. These are the girls who struggled their way through school. I mean, that was a big sacrifice to make those girls go to a Kurdish village school, to a Turkish school, high school, to a Turkish um, college. And they were still at college in Diyarbakir when, the fi when, when fighting was going on in school last year. The man himself, Israeli, was right after the return, he was shot by Kurdish uh, shepherds from the next village. He almost died. He was in a coma for days. But he got up again, and he's fighting again. And my point about him is that when I made a radio feature about him last year, I was asking everybody, it was a long feature, and I was asking everybody how they want to be identified, because I didn't want to make mistakes, you know. Some people said, identify me as an Assyrian, identify me as an Ameri um, Aramean. Some said I want to be called Suryani or Soyuyu. But I asked everybody, and I did it how they wanted it. And when I asked Israel, he said, Personally, um, I understand myself to be an Aramean, but please don't call me that in the radio feature because it's divisive and I don't want to be divided. I don't want people to think that I'm trying to divide them. I want to not use my identity against them. I think this is excellent. I think you should know this and I think this is very inspirational. And with that, I will close.
Okay, uh, I think we've solved our technical problems and I'll speak from here so I can give you the pictures. I brought some pictures. Um, I am, I thank you for the invitation. I'm very honored to be speaking here as a non-Assyrian. And um, I fear I won't be able to tell you anything that you don't all know yourselves, but maybe it will be useful for you a little bit as a perspective of an outsider, as a reflection, so to speak because there's been much talk here about um, self-determination and future and identity. And in a way, a part of identity is also your reflection in the eyes of outsiders, isn't it? Because I'm sure that you've all been frustrated by the perception in Germany or in Holland of being just Turks. Must be, I imagine it to be incredibly frustrating to have, been, to have uh, um, had to leave your homeland and um, then be qualified as a Turk or be asked during Ramadan if you're fasting. So I think reflection, how outsiders see you, is always an important part of identity. And maybe I can give you some perspective on that. What I'm going to be speaking about, and I will introduce myself here, is I will be speaking about... Is this? Yeah. Um, I'm next figure like this. Well, you all know where that is. That is Tur Abdin, um, about 15 years ago, the village of Kafru that later became, uh, that became a symbol for the attempt to return to Tur Abdin and to go back to the land and uh, take repossession of it. Um, and at, that sta at this stage, I might introduce myself. I am a German, I am a journalist, and I spent 20 years in Turkey um, covering Turkey. And about 15 years ago, I was covering the Kurdish issue and I traveled around what I thought of as, and what many people still think of as Kurdistan, and I came across this village, and in this village, the ruins of this village, Kafru, I met some um, Assyrians from Germany and from Switzerland who were climbing around the ruins just as I was, and I asked them what they were doing there, and they explained that they were um, trying to seize the chance that had opened with uh, the EU reform process to return to their village and resettle it, and I asked them, um, why in the world they would leave their good jobs and their livelihoods in Western Europe and the security and the education of their children to resettle an uh, absolutely derelict village where the fields had been burned and uh, where the Kurdish neighbors were riding their donkeys to market. And they replied that they felt such a responsibility for the history of their people. They said, if we, don't, you know, if we do not do this, if we do not return to the land, the land will be lost forever. And so will our faith, our culture, our people. We feel a histor historic resp responsibility for our people to do this. And this fascinated me as a German, because um, you know, it's now living in Western Europe, that that is quite a rare thing. Um, and I'm not sure you treasure it enough to have this sense of historical mission of responsibility. And it fascinated me so much that I spent the next 15 years following the return process, which began with so much hope in that year and in that picture that you see here. Um, Psychology, research in psychology has shown, and I think just to um, enhance your appreciation of this historic sense of responsibility that I find in all Assyrians, and I'm sure all of you have it here, uh, research in psychology has shown that the happiest people, uh, uh, um, a constitutive element of happiness is being able to live for something that is larger than yourself not just the next car or television, but to believe in something, be it nation, God, history, to be fighting, to be working for something together. This constitutes, this makes people happy. And I think there, for all the, um, for all the sacrifices and all the repression and um, all the homesickness and all the problems that you endure as Assyrians, you have this to be uh, which is a, a huge richness, a, a part of happiness that you can pass on to your children and you are passing it on to your children. So, back to the current process, I spent 15 years, and I didn't realize at the time it, that it would only be 15 years, covering this process, which continued as follows. I worked as a journalist covering it for international media, for the New York Times, for German and Swiss Radio, German uh, newspapers. And um, I found that was not enough, and I went back to the university, took a fellowship, and I covered it in an academic fashion. I researched the process, and we tried to formulate um, solutions to certain problems of the return to interest German politicians in supporting the process, to um, introduce uh, solutions to the property problems in Turabtin, uh, to get uh, German uh, judiciary branches and advisors involved. Because for a while it looked <coughs> like this. This is the same village 10 years after my first picture. 
Again, Kafru, many of you will probably know these people here, two from Switzerland, two from Germany, a newborn child, and the village risen up from the ruins behind them. Um, and, um, and then it continued like this. This picture is from last year. It all went south and it all went wrong, and here are the fields around the same village burning and on fire after the PKK has attacked the Turkish uh, outpost quite close to the village, and the crops and the fields and everything are being ruined once again. And um, after 15 years, this process has come to a very disappointing end. But if I offer you my observation <laughs> on the process today, I think it is, um, it is because I think it's important not to just brush it aside. I think it was a very important, not only experiment, endeavor, it was a testament to the spirit of this people that you would try to undertake something as big as this. And I think it needs to be analyzed, it needs to be understood what worked and what didn't work. And most of all, I think, it, um, I mean it as a tribute to the people who attempted this. There are um, hundreds, maybe thousands, who were involved in this, about a hundred in the front line, thousands backing it up. And um, yesterday there was much talk of how little is done, how, how Assyrians are lethargic and not doing enough. Now here were some people who did a lot, who put their lives on the line and their whole existences and their families. I think it was an enormous thing to have done and it needs to be appreciated and I would like to pay a tribute. And I did with a report I published and um, I would like to do so by looking back at this whole process with you, if I may. So we go back to the beginning of it all. I'm going to put this picture up again. This, as you all recall, was a time of hope in Turkey and in Europe, with the European Union opening its arms to Turkey, Turkey trying to accelerate reforms, trying to join the European Union. There was a lot of hope about, and um, when the government uh, published a decree saying that um, their EU uh, efforts could be hampered by not letting the Syriacs return, the, Syri uh, the Assyri Assyrians, excuse me, they jumped at it, a lot of people jumped at it and made the best of it and um, um, invested their livelihoods and, and all their savings into trying to return. It was a time of real hope and it could have worked. And of course, it did work for a while. There were um, about a hundred people who did return permanently, thousands who started returning seasonally, millions of euros pilled, uh, poured into rebuilding houses, churches, monasteries, some monasteries were reopened, like Mo'aho and um, Mo'amalika was restored, Mo'agabra was restored. Young monks returned from the diaspora and took up their posts again. A whole new economy began flourishing with building these villas around the region. Um, wine production, Assyrian wine was produced there again. For the first time in the history of the Turkish Republic, a, uh, an Assyrian newspaper was published, a monthly newspaper which is still publishing. Youth groups started coming from, um, from Europe and even America. And this, I think, is really, really important because these people who were working for the return here, these were the ones we see in, in the picture. These were from the last generation that was still born in Tuaktin and still remembered it and has it present in their mind. To me, the last generation that was capable of trying to effect a return because they had the, re the roots there, they had the passion there, and they had the will to return. It was always clear, if this fails, it fails forever. And um, by bringing the youth groups to the region, they were able to restart, to reconnect, to bridge the uh, generation gap. I think that thousands of young people traveled around the region in those years when things were looking up and uh, reconnected with, uh, with a homeland that they had never known. They only knew from the stories of their parents. Some of them even stayed. Uh, some became returning year after year. Some were very passionate and tried to rebuild their parents' homes. Um, so it was a real time of hope and joy, and anything seemed possible. And at this point, we started trying to um, involve the, uh, the European side and the Turkish side and to bring them together to um, find solutions to those problems that remain. But then we all know what happened then. The European Union stopped dangling the carrot in front of uh, um, Turkey. Turkey resurged, to, uh, went back to nationalism, the PKK started attacking again, war broke out in Syria, ISIS started attacking Christians there, and then last year full-scale war broke out again in, in Southeast Anatolia and finished all hope. And now we come to 
the situation we have is this. This is a picture a Turkish photographer friend of mine took when we were there last year recording for Focus magazine. It's taken in the village of Anvaldo and I think it symbolizes really well the current situation. Um, it is a goodbye to Turabdin, is uh, what I think it is. And why did it go wrong? We need to not analyze this because these people were not dreamers, they were not crazy, they were not delusional. They seized a chance that was really there and it could have worked. So um, we do owe it to them to go back and think about um, uh, why it didn't go wrong. And this is what my report was about, analyzing the reasons. Number one, I think, is when we're spreading the blame around, is we need to talk about the European Union. One, in a wider sense, that the uh, accession process was turned out to be a mirage, that even at the best of times, when Turkey was making a real effort to make those reforms, to fulfill all the conditions, to join the European Union, and there was a huge enthusiasm in the country, and everybody meant it. People on the street meant it. The government was sincere in their efforts. Even then, Europe was not really sincere about it. And um, when that became clear to Turkey, all the, the, the fire went out of, uh, the passion went out of the EU drive, and, um, and the reforms just fizzled out. So I think the European Union bears a share of blame in, in the fact that everything went south in the end. But also the individual countries, and here I think, uh, the countries, the host countries where the diaspora lives today, especially those in uh, um, Germany, which I know most about, Sweden I know less about, but Switzerland, Belgium, Holland, all those countries where, um, whose passports Assyrians hold today. I think they bear a responsibility and at the same time, this is maybe a time for a little self-criticism too, the diaspora is also a little responsible for this side of it, that those countries never became involved in the effort to return to Turabtin. And the diaspora never made enough of an effort to involve those countries. I know from my own country that Germany never took responsibility for this. Germany, German politicians were not even aware of this at a time when all over Germany, Assyrians were calling each other and saying, we can go home and let's try this and return associations were springing up in Augsburg and Gütersloh and everywhere for all these villages, return associations were being formed. Nobody in Germany even caught on to this. Like I said, I mean, your average German on the street might still think half of, uh, uh, don't, not see the difference between a Turk and a Syrian. And even those go, uh, politicians who, who you'd think would care, when I contacted them, knew nothing about the return process. The embassy in, in Ankara, the German embassy in Ankara, which should have been protecting um, Assyrians' property rights, because I mean, German citizens' property rights in Turakin, had no idea about the problem. All they knew about was Morgapi. Nobody in Germany, uh, from Claudia Roth to Heyre Beathilke through the whole parliament, had any idea that this was going on, and they should have, because it would have stood a much better chance if the diaspora had managed to secure the support of their countries. I mean, you are German citizens, you are Swedish citizens, you are Belgian, Dutch citizens, and those countries now owe you allegiance. But that didn't happen, and that had catastrophic uh, consequences, I think. Number one, when things did go wrong, uh, in terms of property, in terms of security, uh, there was no protection, there was no backup, there was no consular assistance. And um, there was, and there were some, with support from Europe, some wonderful projects could have been made, and there were great ideas from people in the diaspora, from these people who were trying to make it happen. <clears throat> For example, it would have been so important to have an education project, a bilingual education project, where um, Germany and Turkey come to an arrangement that you can have uh, minority schools in Turakdin. One school would have been enough, a school teaching in German and in Turkish, so that those people who were bringing their children back from Germany could ease them in and keep them speaking German and at the same time learning Turkish. And you could have had even, and it would have been possible in the reform hope of the time, to supplement that with um, Assyrian and maybe even Kurdish lessons as side lessons. It would have been a spectacular project, enabling people to bring their children back from Europe without fearing that they would uh, lose their whole education. You could have included Kurds into it by <coughs> offering Kurdish, you could have offered Assyrian. And this would have been possible if the countries had become involved. And maybe the countries would have been involved if the diaspora had been more, had persevered more, had tried more to involve their countries, the countries that they were citizens in, um, for them to take responsibility and support the return process in an organized manner. But this didn't happen. People just packed up and went on their own, which is 
again, amazing, you know, putting your whole life savings into this return project and risking it on your own, risking your children and risking uh, not ever being able to return and risking what has in fact happened now uh, to some of these people, which I'll explain. Um, but it might have been um, more prudent to make it a more organized effort and to involve invoke the help of, uh, of the uh, host countries. Now that being said, of course, it's also um, not only the diaspora's fault, but also the fault of those countries that they were not um, looking out for their citizens' rights. But um, of course, you don't, like as we said yesterday, you won't get any help <clears throat> if you don't ask for it. Another pr very practical problem for those uh, who are Germans, as this one family, this, this map, it's white. They are German citizens, and as all German citizens uh, experience, the Germans had a double problem here because of uh, German nationality law, which precludes them from taking dual citizenship, which means that <clears throat> they have the choice of either um, becoming Turkish again and then losing all their rights in Germany, a dangerous proposition, or remaining German and living as foreigners, as foreign nationals in their own land, which most of them then chose to do but which turned out to be hugely problematic for this man we're looking at in this picture, whom I'm sure many of you know. His daughters uh, brought, did so much for the return. They, they came back as children. They completed Turkish, uh, a Turkish village school in a Kurdish village because they had no, they, they had no alternative. They then went to a lycée, to a, German, to a Turkish uh, lycée, and completed their education in Turkish. And then they even went on, they went to college in Diyarbakir, all in Turkish, all these, you can imagine children who've grown up in Germany, and they fought their way all through uh, school and college, only to find at the end that because they are German citizens and they couldn't take dual citizenship, <coughs> that now that they are teachers, they can't work as teachers, they can't be employed as teachers because um, the state couldn't employ them uh, uh, since they don't have the nationality. So they find now they have lousy second-rate jobs, no social security, no insurance, and they have done it all practically for nothing. While their father, for other reasons, uh, went the other way and took Turkish citizenship. He was stripped of his German passport, and uh, he has no right of return, which is, at the best of times, was hugely problematic since obviously his all his brothers and sisters and parents and his extended family live in Germany, and it is so difficult to get a visa from Germany, from Turkey, much less in, in Southeast Anatolia, where it's practically impossible. So he has been cut off from his complete family, and what's worse now, with the war rising up around him and engulfed in, in flames, he is stuck there. He, has, he can't go back, even as his fields burn around him. So um, uh, Europe has not played a very good role in this whole drama. And I think uh, blame needs to be apportioned before we get to um, the next problem, which is Turkey. Now, Turkey, in that time of hope and in that time of reform, uh, much as it's vilified, I think the intentions were there and the intentions were good, and it could even have gone further. It need not. It, it did, did not necessarily need to finish up where it's finished up now. I believe still that if the European Union had done more for the process, and if people like Abdullah Gül, the former president, and Bülent Arınç, the former vice prime minister, and so on, had had more moral courage and guts, if they had prevailed instead of Recep Tayyip Erdogan, we would be in a very, very different place now. So um, it didn't necessarily have to come to this, and I think the Turks at the beginning, or uh, many of them still are, were goodwilled. It didn't, um, they didn't undercut this process from the beginning. I know from personal experience, from my research there, um, I know the Kaimakam of, of media, that he was very much engaged in this process. He was a positive figure. And we had many gestures that showed that the Turks were not just talking the talk in the beginning when they were inviting uh, Assyrians to come back, but they, at many echelons, they did mean it and they were ready to, to do something for it. I mean, even this year, as recently as this year, uh, the villages in Turabdin were restored with their uh, Assyrian names. They, uh, they got to put up um, signs again, stating their, uh, giving their original names. But so there was, there was a lot of goodwill. And for a time, of course, they were, uh, Turkey was actively considering a new constitution in, in the passion and in the, the, the hope of those years after in uh, the first decade of this century. Um, they were debating a constitution which would have um, made all the minority peoples constitutive peoples of Turkey. And there was real hope there, but I think one of the first warning signs, or the main 
<coughs> indicator that something, there, there's a deeper danger here, came with this issue. Um, most of you, any of you who, who are from, uh, originally from Anatolia, will know this piece of paper. It's a tapu, it's a, it's a bill of uh, property ownership for, uh, for land in, in a, a Syrian village. Um, I think this, I mean, any of you who are from the region will know this and will know this so much better than me, that this property issue is um, a huge issue that just goes to the heart of the whole relationship between Turkey and its, um, I don't want to say minority people, it's, um, how do you say, indigenous people, indigenous people, the people who've been there for longer than they have. Um, because even as reforms were going on and there was hope and the EU reforms were being made, one of the very EU reforms started working against Assyrians here. And it's an irony that Turkey was required to modernize its land registry to comply with EU law to make more modern land registry. But what happened in fact was that they, uh, this chance was that uh, this occasion was used to seize the, the land of the Assyrians from them and to, to make a, a huge blatant land grab and so that many of the Assyrians who came back found that their land had just been stolen by the Turkish state. Um, and technically what happened was that a law was being applied that if a uh, property is not used for 20 years, um, then it reverts to the state. This is, this is a, a legal norm that exists everywhere in the world. There's nothing wrong with it, except for if somebody has been forced off their land, obviously it cannot apply and provisions were not made for that. But, um, under, under this law, as the land register was being modernized, thousands and thousands and thousands of parcels of, law, uh, uh, of, of land, mainly belonging to um, Syriacs and Yazidis, were expropriated by the Turkish treasury, and um, it's a, a hugely complicated process even attempting to get them back. There are actually, and I'm going to touch on this later, there are two forms of expropriation. The legal expropriation by the state, whereby where the state says, you have not uh, uh, plowed this land for 20 years, so it is fallow, and thus it reverts to the state, or a forest had grown on it, it reverts to the state. This is the legal expropriation. And the other one that we're gonna go into at more length when we're gonna talk about uh, the Kurdish environment is the illegal expropriation, whereby neighbors made advan uh, uh, took advantage of the absence of the Syriacs to, um, to grab the land and stake a claim on it, or just plain take it with weapons. Um, I think what makes this property issue more than um, a practical problem, and of course it's a huge practical problem, I and mean, so many families were, were stripped, lost all they owned. But I think what, what made this problem so sinister and really made this the alarm signal, the, the warning signal that um, this was never going to work, is that it is a continuation of of a very old Turkish policy. Actually, it's the at the core of the Turkish state, and it's happened again and again and again. The expropriation of anyone weaker, a minority of non-Muslim minorities by the Turkish state. It happened after the uh, genocide of 1915 to the uh, Armenians and the Assyrians too. It happened to the Greeks when they were chased out. It happened when all the church property was expropriated in the 70s. It happened to the Jews in the 30s. And um, interestingly, it's, and this is the first time I think it's happened to a Muslim, uh, my, my, it's not even a minority, but I mean, what's happening right now in Turkey with the Gulenists is quite the same, you know, a, a whole community is being made responsible for one evil, and the first thing they do is they seize everybody's property, billions and billions of property worth. So um, I think this is an instinct that, the, the, the Turkification instinct of the Turkish state, it's, um, as always, as, um, as Marx and Engels uh, pointed out, it's always about the money, it's always about the economy. And um, the, the property issue was actually one that when there was still hope, we worked on a lot because property there has been expropriated so often and redistributed so often and then it is so hard to get you know, you, you would think you'd come back and say, give me back my land, but it can't happen because the Kurdish family is now living on it and if the state chases them off, they, uh, there are consequences. So um, in my project, I was, what we were trying to do was apply the German experience because Germany has had similar, maybe comparable experiences in that 
Uh, land was expropriated again and again um, by the Nazis, by the Soviet Union, by East Germany. And um, these cycles had been going on for so long that it became really, really difficult to redistribute distribute property to the rightful owners. But Turkey, after the wall fell, uh, Germany, after the wall fell in 1990, developed really extensive uh, legislation to um, address that problem. And they found very just and fair solutions. And what we were trying to do is bring, those, bring the experts from Germany over to Turkey and to try to ex apply those solutions and find fair, um, find fair settlements for all. And actually that was working quite well when the last parliament was elected in 1915. All the um, deputies from those provinces, um, Mardin, Shirnak, uh, Diyarbakir, and so on, Batman, agreed to come to the workshop. The Kaimakam of Media agreed to come to the workshop. And we were really looking forward to trying to address this property issue in a, in a um, positive way. But then, of course, um, things happened. The, war, the, the new election came, the war came, and everything went south. And of course, there is no hope of doing anything there now. To me, the property issue is never going to be solved. It is very much over. Oops. And connected to that, of course, is the question of rights in Turkey, rights for the Assyrians. Um, again, at the time we were taking that picture, um, there was still hope for a new constitution. Turkey was debating a new constitution. The Turkish government, the Parliamentary Commission, had actually invited clerics like the um, Patriarch of Constantinople to contribute to, um, uh, to give their views on, on the new constitution. And things were looking very, very hopeful, but um, in 2012, I think, or 2013, uh, the process was abandoned, and uh, there, uh, if ever a new constitution is spoken of again, it certainly won't be that pluralistic liberal one that we were all dreaming of then. It'll be uh, probably Erdogan's presidential constitution. So that hope is over, and um, as that hope went, so went all the others, because as we all know, the uh, Syrians do not even enjoy the uh, rights accorded uh, to them by the Lausanne Treaty in Turkey, whereas the Greeks and the Armenians and the Jews can have their own schools, and at least they have a right to their language and education and culture. The Assyrians do not. And um, that proved to be very, very fatal for the return process, because as we're looking at this picture from Kafro here, you see a young man at the left of the picture who has returned from Switzerland, and at that time, the village was full of young people who had returned and were full of hope. But the fact that uh, there is no right to, to their own education, to education in the mother tongue in Turkey, meant that uh, the, the new generation could not take root. There was no hope. I think 15 or 20 young people returned to that village alone with their parents, the teenagers and children. Thank you very much. And um, this young man is no longer there, and none are so are, None of the others. There's one young man remaining in the village today. There are these two young girls who are uh, um, teaching, who are trying to teach, who couldn't get jobs. And all the other kids have fled back to Europe, one after the other, because there's no future, there is no rights, and there is no education and no hope for them there. Now turning to this picture, I think illustrates quite well the um, relationship between the Assyrians and uh, the the Kurds who now constitute the majority in this land, in Turabdin. It's, um, it's a place that my dear friend Elio showed me. Uh, this is Mor Ahu, outside of Midiat, a fifth century monastery, which is again built over uh, an Assyrian temple to the storm god, Hadad. And next to it, we see um, an edifice recently constructed by a Kurdish businessman who grabbed the land and put something on it. And I think it's a very symbolic picture because it illustrates very adequately the, the relationship there. There is no legal basis for this. The land was just com completely seized. And um, as you know, there 